Good evening, everyone. Welcome to House of Sweden. And uh, thank you for fighting the rain and the weather and the traffic and everything that was out there. I am always curious if we have some first timers here tonight, do we? Yes, a few, extra welcome. So uh, I'm Linda Sackerson, I'm the culture counselor working here at the embassy since three years back, sent out by the Ministry of Culture and um, working here as a diplomat and we coming from a background as producer and artistic director from the performing arts, working with uh, dance and theater and uh, contemporary circus, mostly at the City Theater in Stockholm. And uh, so I'm super excited about this gathering tonight, this artist talk focusing on the Swedish choreographer Örjan Andersson and his work that is coming up uh, here tomorrow, no, Thursday evening is the opening at the Kennedy Center of uh, Goldberg Variations through his eyes and moves. And uh, also for a discussion on Swedish dance and choreography. And uh, when reflecting on this, I thought to myself that it's kind of a an anomaly to speak about Swedish dance and choreography, also because dance in itself is so international and Swedish dance <laughs> in itself is so international. Uh, the companies are, are based from with dancers from all over the world and uh, Swedish dance is extremely influenced by especially European and American choreography. It's almost like um, Dance was globalized uh, long bef before the term even existed in the rest of the world. Um, but here in this American context and with American eyes on what we do back home, we would still like to explore this question a little bit and also in dialogue with you. So this conversation tonight is uh, hopefully an interactive one with you and we will open up for questions, but you can interrupt us anytime with your reflections or thoughts. Um, and some of the questions are if there are elements still in this international arts field that are typically Swedish or Nordic perhaps. And um, if there are influences that we don't think about in contemporary dance, like from the folk dance or folk music, for example, uh, also, Örjan Andersson explored that a little bit in a piece from 2013 called Karmer kring blå, which I won't try to translate. <laughs> and uh, perhaps there is an emotional state or a in, um, philosophical state that you can, that is Swedish. Uh, I think about that in this room right now, since we're uh, exhibiting Karin Bros who comes from deep Värmland right now, and her pictures are, I think, um, reminding us of uh, Swedish nature and forests and melancholy. And in the other room, I would like you to uh, check out the new Bergman exhibitions. This whole year we're exploring and remembering and celebrating Bergman's centennial, also in collaboration with the Kennedy Center. And in the room, in the back here, uh, we have two exhibits on Ingmar Bergman and his work exploring the process of Fanny and Alexander, but also his uh, costumes and like moods that he worked with. And I think he is in the Swedish DNA in some way. <laughs> there are also uh, a lot of Swedish uh, choreographers in the US right now and especially this week, tomorrow night, the ambassador Karin Olof's daughter and me will go to Chicago to join the opening of uh, another Swedish choreographer called Alexander Ekman, who's made a piece for the Joffrey Ballet, or he, he made it for the um, Royal Opera Ballet in Stockholm, but it's coming to the Joffrey Ballet. It's called A Midsummer Night's Dream. And it's not Shakespeare, it's, uh, it's more a play, playing with Swedish cliches or prejudice actually, like on uh, the, the never ending uh, light in the summer night 
and the Swedish sin, and also some hay fever. Um, and uh, also this week, another Swedish choreographer, Pontus Lidberg, will come with the Geneva Ballet to Joyce in New York with his new work. Um, before introducing the panel, I would also like to thank our partners, Kennedy Center especially, for uh, being here and for working with us, and also for I to thank ICANS, International Consortium for Advancement in Choreography here in DC. And now it's time to introduce the panel. So uh, first, of course, uh, the choreographer in focus tonight, Urjan Andersson who uh, actually didn't have the long, early dance background, but came from soccer, I learned, <laughs> into dance, and uh, also has a background with the Israeli company Batsheva, and who in 1996 started his own company, a project-based company, Anderson Dance. He has also done commissioned work for uh, Netherlands Dance Theater that was here the other week, the Royal Swedish Ballet, um, that I think a few of you know from uh, Mats Ek's performance of Juliet and Romeo the other year at the Kennedy Center, the Kullberg Ballet that we actually presented here last year, and uh, Gothenburg Ballet, which is also a very strong <coughs> Swedish company. Uh, recently, Urjan has also worked with theater and opera, with the Bisses uh, Carmen and uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. We also are so, so happy to welcome Alicia Adams here tonight, who is the Vice President of International Programming and Dance at the Kennedy Center, and a background with Alvin Ailey, American Dance Theater, and Belafonte Enterprises, Harlem School of the Arts, to mention a few uh, things. And Magnus Nordberg is also with, here us, uh, with us here tonight. He is the manager and producer for Anderson Dance, and many other Swedish choreographers. He will uh, talk a little bit about that. He's also, I would like to say, like a one-man networking industry, <laughs> creating exchange and uh, collaborations and projects uh, all over the world. And uh, really, by, by, his, by his work, uh, also created a lot of development for, for Swedish dance and choreography the last 20 years. And last but not least, our moderator tonight is another passionate person, Lise Hellström Svenningsson, who is a journalist, journalist and especially uh, in the arts, covering theater and dance, also working as a critic. And on the side, when she's not writing herself, teaching in creative writing and dance history at the university in Gothenburg. Special thanks to you, Liz, and I also want to extend the thanks to your husband, Ulf, who is here, who is an artist, who is a visual artist. Uh, and the special thanks goes to uh, me, letting me ruin your vacation in Washington, D.C. Because when I found out that Liz was coming here this specific week when we were planning this talk with Urjan, I jumped on her and asked if she could come and join us tonight. So thank you, and uh, please come up on stage. So welcome, nice to see you all here. Uh, so we're gonna have a talk here, and we're gonna do a, a lot of talk, and not only from the panel, I hope, as Linda said, you may be, you're well, well, very welcome to just take part in it. And, uh, but I think we should start here with the, the artist in focus tonight. Urja, how do you feel? <laughs> just sort of, uh, so you feel good because you're just preparing the performance. Hello. There's a premiere at the Kennedy Center the day after tomorrow. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine, uh, I think. We are doing fine. We had our first uh, rehearsal today at, um, at the studio at uh, Kennedy Center. and. Uh, so, after a little jet lag, and I think we're, we're getting there. We had some uh, diseases just before we came, so I had to throw around a little bit with the parts, but it's fine. Yeah, 
It's the time. It's the time of the year where disease uh, sort of grab us. So uh, we will sort of go back. Linda made an introduction on you, but um, I would like to go back at least uh, to to start with your dancing career. As she said, you didn't start as a little kid. You were 19 years, I was told, when you sort of met the dance. How did it, how did it come? Well, I was interested in, I've always been interested in these things here, like arts and music, and <clears throat> but I was from a small town and there was no dance there whatsoever, so that wasn't a possibility. Luckily, there was, it was close to another, a little bit bigger town, and they had a a uh, guest appearance from the Colbert Ballet <clears throat> and a Swedish choreographer called Mats Ek with a Colbert. And they did a piece and I went in and I saw that and that was a big experience, you know, because you had, you got the art, the sonography and the light and, but then also you get the physicality and the acting and so forth. So it was a mix of it all and it sort of swept me away and I thought, I can do that, I think. <laughs> oh, that's good. And you were trained because you were a soccer player. Yes, yes. So you were physic uh, physically, you were... A I was boy. quite stiff, mind you. But uh, uh, after a while, I, I, I started to take uh, dance lessons. And um, uh, I got, uh, I don't know, hybris. What, do you, what is that in English? Hybris. Hybris. Hybris? hybris. You say Isn't hybris that? in you English. You sort of think you're yeah. best to the king of the world. Yeah. yeah. So I applied to a school in Stockholm after three months of dancing, which was ridiculous, and I, I didn't come in. So I had to go up. I went up to the headmaster and asked, "How is it possible? I've danced for three months." Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I got to, I got into a preparatory uh, year, and then that's um, and that's on the way you are. That's yeah. how it started. Yes. Yeah. Oh. That's interesting, and I bring this up because you see, Sweden is a small country, and coming from a small uh, town like Eslöv, that's in the south of Sweden, and it's about eighteen and a half thousand inhabitants, I think. Something yeah. like that. Something yes. like that, and uh, maybe there is not a dance teacher, or it wasn't. It, it's growing now. You get it in school, but in those days, and I was coming from another small uh, town a bit further up, and so I really can understand the uh, the situation. And then you know. With dance, it's it's often such a moment. You can many people can recognize when when I discovered dance. Uh, I met so many. It's interesting to hear even a, a choreographer. And then you say you were a bit stiff. If you go and see the choreography the day after tomorrow, you can't believe he's saying that. <laughs> okay. And then there is another question that uh, Linda brought up: Is there a Swedish DNA? She said, my, my, "Can we trace it?" Do you feel in your dance, is there a Swedish DNA in your dance? Uh, maybe, I, I, can't, I can't really say that I thought about that, but I can't say that I, I'm sitting there watching my pieces and, and, and thinking that, that they're particularly Swedish. I don't think so. I think uh, other choreographers are more that way. I can make a Swedish work, you know, I can make a, a piece about uh, Swedish culture and stuff like that, but yeah. How would Since I lived in, in Israel for quite a long time and I was close to Ahad Maharin and Batsheva, I, I would say that co that colored me uh, more than anything else, I think. There are people saying that dance is, a in, uh, is an international language. Would you agree on that? Definitely. Yeah? And still, you know, but don't you think we need some cultural uh, understanding to really... And I don't like the word understand, actually, when I'm talking about them, but to uh, experience dance. Um, we, I, I think dance, uh, like music, is uh, something that you understand uh, with your heart. And uh, I think dance, like music, well, maybe not all, but most of it, I think, I mean, if you like dance, if you like a dance piece, you don't really sit there and understand it. It's like, you don't sit there and understand Beethoven. You sit and you can like Beethoven or you can dislike Beethoven, but trying to sit there and understand that uh, the dance is the same. It's like you can, I mean, dance can hit you so hard and uh, it can stick with you for many, many years. And that's the, that's the power of dance. Uh, to me, I mean, it, it can also be very, very bad, but, uh, <laughs> 
But when it hits, it's amazing. I feel, I mean, it beats it all. And you started as a dancer, but uh, that was a, a career for uh, some years. And you, with the very famous companies like Batshiva, and you were uh, got in, got in in touch with Matsik and Birgit Kulberg, the founder of the Kulberg Ballet. Uh, but rather soon, you went on chor as a choreographer on your own. How did this come? Uh, well, we got to do a, a workshop in the in the company, so each dancer should sort of were forced more or less to choreograph. And that was in your uh, during your time at Vesheva. Yeah, that was in, in Tel Aviv when I lived there. So, so that's uh, and I mean I think right when I started it, at first I didn't want to do it, but when I started, it felt uh, very natural to me, and uh, dance became sort of secondary and. If you're going to deal with dance, if you're going to have work as a profession, that should not be secondary, because it's not a normal job. It's a lot of it's a lot of work and sweat from ten to five o'clock. So, if you're not burning one hundred percent, it's uh, you should get out of there. So, uh, for me, the choreography was uh, became bigger, and uh, so it, it wasn't a hard choice for me. And now you've been uh, creating a lot of work. It's at least uh, how do you, do you ca can you count them still? No, I, I don't know. I've it's a lot. It's a, it's it's a lot. I, I it's started yeah. 90 s Ni in five, no, ninety five. Ninety two. Ninety two. The first one. Well, that was the workshop. Yeah. But then I. Ninety six. Yeah, ninety six. Yeah. I think I, 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 think, I think I got my first commission work by Kulberg. Yeah. Uh, ninety six. I know it was ninety six because I, I read it. You know. Oh, it's yeah, it's in the records. It's in the record. And do you, do you remember what piece it was? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, Arrival of the Queen of Sheba. Exactly. Yes, yes. That's it. I saw it, and it was it 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 really hit me. So, uh, Alicia, please tell us: Is there? A, can you find a Swedish DNA in dance? I know you because you're so experienced. You've seen dance from all over the world. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know that there's a a Swedish DNA, but I think that what we um, as Americans see is something very fresh in what the Swedes are bringing to, to choreography. In um, Orean's work, uh, this piece that we will uh, have, uh, open on, on Thursday, for me it's reminiscent of um, the freshness I felt with Paul Taylor many years ago when he began to uh, uh, choreograph and present uh, very, very new works that uh, relied on uh, pedestrian movement and Bach and Beethoven's work, and it was just great. And when I see uh, this piece, the Goldberg Variations, I too think that it has that that lift. It seems vibrant and 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 fun. Also, I've I've seen um, Orion's work on the um, um, Gutenberg um, Ballet mm -hmm. when they were here for the Nordic Cool Festival in 2013. I think that piece was called. Beethoven's Variations 32. And so I was interested in this piece because of that piece and that it was using classical music. In this piece, he's using music that um, is, is live and on stage with the, with the dancers. This is a question I haven't asked Orion, but as I watch the piece, just wondering if it is um, improvised uh, in some way or is it choreographed? But um, and, I don't, and I don't know the answer to that as the as the dancers uh, play with the play with the movement. I've also seen the work of um, of, of Pontus. What's Pontus's last yeah. name? Limburg. Limburg. Right. Very right. When he came to this 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 country, he became very engaged. I've seen him his performances performances of his work at the at the Joyce Theater and of course Matzak um, because of the. Kohlberg Ballet, but for uh, again, for um, we were very interested in having him for Nordic Cool 2013, but we weren't able to. But a few years ago, maybe it's just a couple of years ago, we brought um, the Royal Ballet, Royal Swedish Ballet, and his production of um, Juliet and Romeo, which was also quite exciting for us, very different from any version that we'd ever presented at the at the Kennedy Center. I'm not sure what our audiences felt, except maybe pushed a bit because it was was different. But I always think that we need to take audiences to a different place, that we can't just 
have them rest on what they, what they know. We certainly want to give them some of what they do know, but also that which allows them to, to grow and to take in, in, in more. So that's what I think of. Um, in what, w in what way was it so well? Did the well, it's very push? dark, you know. <laughs> Um, it, it, it sort of broke all, all conventions in terms of, of choreography and even how the story was, was, was told. It was not the romantic Romeo and Juliet that you usually get from a, from a ballet company. They were not dressed in tutus. So it was, um, you know, I think it was a groundbreaking piece that um, got critical acclaim around the, around the world. I think he's a brilliant choreographer as, as well. Yeah, and Matsek, he's also he's known for this breaking uh, in his ballet because uh, the first time he did it was actually Giselle. Uh, but I, I think it was even when he made Swan Lake, you know, and had male swans dancing and they had no hair upon and, and they no, had no uh, point shoes and so on. So it was, uh, uh, people were screaming. But uh, when, when it came back in the 80s, it looked like the audience was ready. What about you, Arian? Are you sort of uh, sometimes provoking the audience with breaking things like this? Mm. Well, no, um, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I don't, it's not my purpose uh, yet. I, don't, I'm, I haven't made a piece yet that where I want, where the theme is to provoke. Uh, no. But of course, I mean, if you use classical music, uh, maybe that is uh, lingered to a particular way of moving, and I definitely don't move in that way. So, but I also find that there is a, in that contrast, there is uh, it opens up for something new, you know. And uh, I agree. I mean, <coughs> sure, if you want Swan like classical Swan like you sh that should be, but. Uh, and people that likes that should go and see that. But uh, that should be for people also that uh, wants to see new th stuff. And so, yeah, I think that combination of the Baroque music and contemporary dance is really quite interesting. The juxtaposition, and th the reason I was interested in bringing the company is because I was trying to do a, a series of dance and music, and so it was this um, Anderson Anderson dance and. Uh, Scottish Ensemble, we just had Mark Morris and uh, Leila and Majnoon, where the orchestra was also on stage. And then it was going to be the um, S Sydney Dance Company and the Australian Chamber Orchestra. But that piece of it fell out, so it sort of it didn't get to be a, a trio of, of um, pieces, but just uh, two presentations that we do that have live, live music but that the musicians are on stage and performing with the, the dancers. I think that that can be successful and sometimes it can be unsuccessful. But I think that in these two pieces, um, Mark, both Mark Morris's and uh, Ron's, that it is it's very, very exciting, very exciting work. I think Mark Morris, uh, um, I don't want to compare myself with that master, but uh, there is something similar with our, he's, he's very musical and he likes right. to, to have the music as the, as the overall theme for, for his pieces. And um, I danced a piece with him myself in Batsheva called Canonic, and uh, that stuck with me for many years. So, and uh, for, for me also Goldberg is, is sort of that, I'm just you know, taking the music as a score and basically in a almost didactic way, just explaining it with bodies. And then um, it sounds maybe boring, but it's very- It's not, <laughs> I can tell you. I, I think that I read though, that you, you turn the music off and really choreograph the, the work and then tried the music to see if it would fit. Did I, is that, did I read that about no, you or somebody I, I, else? No, I do that okay. sometimes because uh, sometimes uh, when I choreograph with the music, it becomes too, uh, it becomes boring. There is nothing that goes against the music, you know. Uh, it's it becomes too good, Direct. or yes. Yeah, so it becomes like we say in Swedish. It becomes cookie on cookie. So, and uh, so therefore, sometimes I I, I can have an an, um, an idea of movement, and then I do that in silence, and then I add music, and something new might appear, or not. But you know. And you must tell us about this interest in the classical, in the big, really big masters, you know, like Bach and Beethoven and 
and also Stravinsky and, and Shostakovich. So how does it, this come? Because I've been, I've been going through my re reviews on uh, Arian's works uh, uh, before this talk, and I, can, I keep on repeating how the music musicality and how uh, you make music in the body sound. So but where does this come from? I don't know. I just uh, the, I like it's great music. <laughs> it's just fun. It, it's 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 an uh, uh, how do you say? Uh, you know, you, I'm, you're lucky to get to to work like this with with uh, that kind of music and to hear it every day and to sort of uh, figure out the structure of it and um, and meet it with with movement. That's. Uh, that's amazing. But it's quite uh, unusual today if we look upon this, uh, the field of new uh, contemporary dance in, in Sweden. Not so many choreographers turn uh, their eyes to uh, their ears to the classical music. So do, do you feel you're sort of this is your path alone? Or? Not, not completely. I mean, I've, I've worked, done many pieces with, with contemporary music uh, and so forth. But I, uh, like in everyday life, I. I um, I like a lot of different music. It's just, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you've been uh, working with uh, the, this classical music when you got it uh, not live, played by an orchestra, and you have, have string uh, quartets, and, and now you even have the, uh, the musicians to dance. How is that? How is that? Because that's quite, that's quite new with this piece, uh, the Goldberg variations. You didn't do that before. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, they are on stage, and I like to show the the source of sound uh, visually. And uh, uh, there there wasn't any uh, reason for them not to move w when they didn't play. I mean, there are eleven musicians, so sometimes five is playing and six is just standing there, and that that was boring. So w I got to get them to move. Uh, so. So I try to see them not as 11 musicians and five dancers, but 16 dancers slash musicians, and some of them are dancing better than others. <laughs> and, uh, so and what do you think about that, Alicia? Yeah, no, I thought the, the proportion was interesting, that you had twice as many musicians as you had dancers, and being a choreographer, that that was something that was unusual, that it might have been the, been the reverse. But clearly, you wanted to work with the with the musicians and to see how you could also manipulate their their mu movement and and play with that a bit. We don't have the musicians here yet, so we have to uh, we have to trust in what you tell us about this. How did you work with them? Did you have the daily class with them? And so how how did you get these musicians to move like they do? Well, this is uh, I mean they are they are fantastic in their fields, but they are completely beginners in dance, and so they were very scared the first workshop I did with them, but they were very cute. They were all dressed in black and had small shoes and stuff, and <laughs> one panicked at lunch, you went home, and so that was only 10, and, and I found out she had a panic attack, and now she loves dance. She's, uh, she's just, uh, I'm, I'm gonna do a new piece with them this autumn, and this, Tell me all the time, but we, this time we need to move more. We need to move <laughs> more. So, no, uh, how you get uh, amateurs to to move is uh, you need to give them keys, different keys. You know, it's uh, so. I thought f in this case they are musicians. They are close to sound, and we can all make sound. And but as we're making a sound, it also incorporates a movement. You no. Know? Or, so I told them to make a little composition, and all of a sudden they were dancing. They didn't think about it, but uh, that's what they did, so. That was one key. Okay, I can understand. And then, if you could go to the professional dancers, what, what kind of dancers do you look for? Because uh, your company, we should perhaps tell a bit, uh, Linda introduced you, your Anderson Dance Company as a project base. So that means you don't have a, you don't have any dancers employed in your company like this. And please, could you tell us about how you work with dancers? Well, technically, we pay, we uh, hire them for a production. Look at me. No, I look <laughs> at my producer because I'm. 
Uh, and then you go to him, how much can, I, can we afford? Yes, Which one yes. could we how have? Many months could can we have Sylvie Guillaume here? Yes, <laughs> yes. But uh, so that is limited, of course, how many I can use and how long I, I can work with them. So uh, that's also why it's good to do co uh, co productions, uh, uh, like with other groups and so forth. But, but what qualities do you look for? Well, it's different, but it's, it's uh, you know, the good thing is you can work with people for many, many years and they become your friends and you know how to get them going and he, they know me and uh, so it's, a, it's a, when you get a commissioned work, if I go to NDT for instance or Coburg, then that's tricky because you have to start from scratch, you know? Hello, my name is Orion Anderson, I work like this and then I have to pick dancer, maybe there are 60 dancers and I'm gonna pick 10 and get to know them in a sort of five, six, seven weeks time, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a tough work. So would you say we have some Anderson dancers in Sweden nowadays? Yes, yes, there is. And yeah. if we sort of should pinpoint what, what's the qualities that you look for to see this is a, an Anderson dancer? Or maybe Ooh, you should ask Alicia that. Could you see any special qualities in the dancers? Sorry. In the, in the dancers in the piece, would, uh, would you sort of trace anything that you would say, this is an Anderson quality? Well, they're very energetic. I mean, they're, very, they're, they're young, they're vibrant. Um, they seem eager to, 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 to interact. A lot of times it's hard to get dancers also to do what they're not used to doing, which is to interact with the musician on the, on the stage. So I would say that Oren is probably working with 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 artists who are interested in that kind of in that kind of work and that kind of kind of movement. Yeah. More than it's not a special technique. We wouldn't say you don't have a Anderson technique like a Martha Graham technique or it depends on how you work as a choreographer. They said that there's, there's a big field, you know. I can I can, you you can work as a dancer as an interpreter, yeah? That means that you are like Matek is doing that all the time. He's been doing it since day one and he's still doing it and many with him. That is, he shows a movement, and you're going to copy that as precise as you can. Yeah, that's over there. Now, and then there's a lot of different things. Over here, mm -hmm. you tell the dancers to make sounds, you know, for instance, or move like a cat, or, and then it becomes their material that they are solving. And, and it's different dancers. Some dancers are incredible copying or interpreting a movement but they are very bad creating movement and, and vice versa. So that, that's, it's a big, big difference how you can work. If you're over here and you tell them to make sounds, then may, you might think, well, what's your, what are you gonna do then if they make all the material? Well, then you have to put them in space and you have to compose and that's tricky. Yeah, because sometimes it's that you, you can uh, always, oh, more and more often, you see in, in the program for the the performances and shows that uh, the choreographer says it's uh, is created uh, in uh, interaction with uh, the dancers like this. So, and sometimes the dancers they feel they don't get the credit for <laughs> their work. But uh, this is the way you work as well. Sort of you you give and take with the dancers, but still it's your because you have a a very uh, special eye for using the space. And Arjan Andersson is one of the few Swedish choreographers that really can make pieces for the big stages. The big stages, you will see it here in uh, Kennedy Center, how to use it. And this is some kind of space interest as well. Yes, but I'm not the first and not the last. I mean, there's many, but not everybody's interested in that. You're, you're right, but... Uh, where I'm coming from in, in Bacheva and all this space is, is very important. I mean, it's, it's a big, big, big part of choreography, space. Still, you s even do these very, very concentrated uh, and sort of, it's, you can't say smaller pieces, but th that, that doesn't uh, take place in the, the really big venues. But it's, it's, more and it's more and more you sort of commission for big companies today. If, if, if I yeah, do that, yeah, yeah. yeah, it, ha yeah. it happens, yes. I, I go back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I think we should need to, to have some pictures now, don't you think so? We need to see it. 
And uh, so we, we just need to have a, a technical help and we're gonna take our chairs aside so you can see, we won't see us doing the performances. And I'll walk you through these pictures a little bit. This is a picture from the Golba Variations that maybe some of you are going to see at the Kennedy Center. Um, one of our dancers, Joseph, and Jonathan, the artistic director of, of Scottish Ensemble, is in, is, in, is in the back of this picture. And this is a piece we just opened last year on Beethoven, three Beethoven sonatas with Per Tengstrand, Swedish pianist who actually lives uh, outside of New York. Um, this piece was t toured in, through Sweden, and we have a live a pianist on stage and a grand piano and three performers. So it's a much smaller creation that we did together. Um, the piece centers around three 20-minute Beethoven sonatas and goes through them as a story. In 2012, we did a piece called Name of the Next Song, based on pure electronic music by a composer called B.J. Nielsen. Uh, a completely different work, which also Orion has done lots of work on electronica or newly written electronic music. And this brings us to this last piece, which is the one that's coming up for us now, called Prelude, which is our next collaboration between Scottish Ensemble, the music ensemble we're working with, and three performers. And we're back to Goldberg Variations. And as you can see uh, in this picture, now it disappeared, <laughs> you can see it here. Um, Arian used the word pedestrian, uh, and also uh, Alicia used the word pedestrian. Uh, the piece also works with objects on stage in some other manners, pedestrian objects or regular objects. And for you who see the piece, you'll see that interaction between both the dancers and the musicians, but also with these objects that forms the stage, the set of the stage is formed by these objects that are brought in and out of this open white space. So that's Anderson Dance, in a little bit brief. Yeah, and then Magnus, when, I, when we have you here and we have the pictures on, then I would like you to introduce some other Swedish dance, right. because you work as a manager and producer with a lot of uh, Swedish uh, choreographers and dancers. What's right. happening in the Swedish dance at the moment, besides right. Anderson Dance, please? So the, um, the, the Swedish dance field, or field of choreography, has expanded in a bombastic way in the last 10, 15 years. And Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, has been the major part of, of, of this, of course. Uh, the, the Sweden, is not a big, uh, Sweden is not a big country. We have about 9 million inhabitants. Uh, we have the, the four major cities that I would also say are the dance cities are Stockholm. It's Gothenburg, who has also one of the biggest international Scandinavian festivals, Gothenburg Dance and Theatre Festival. It's Umeå, way up in the north, which where the population is quite scattered, but uh, they, they work with a lot of touring in this scattered area of Sweden. And then it's Malmö, who is right across from Copenhagen, which is also a very vibrant both theater, music, and dance city. So these four sort of positions of, of dance then connects through smaller cities in Sweden. And we have the big fortune of uh, the, the biggest venue in Sweden, the House of Dance, forming a touring network called the, the Dance Net Sweden, which is quite unique in the world, which tours dance in this quite small country from up north towards smaller and bigger cities through these four bigger cities and down to the south. So uh, many people in smaller cities have been able to see quite experimental work in this last 10 years. Uh, not just the regular dance companies, not just regular classical ballet or just the regular choreographed pieces, but also very experimental work, which has been a great way for both artists to develop, but also audience to develop in Sweden. So this has been a very good thing for us. Um, the one thing that really evolved Swedish dance is uh, the school in Stockholm called DOC, uh, the, of dance, the School of Dance and Circus, University of Dance and Circus, 
who about 10 years ago brought in a number of both Swedish and international uh, teachers, artists and teachers, to really expand the notion of choreography. So nowadays I would say the, there's both the, the Mats Ek working with that sort of choreography, but also a variety of, 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 of a numerous variety of different ways of expressing choreography. And the term extended choreography which is now a big term in choreography everywhere, is really, has really stuck into to Swedish dance, meaning that artists can work with almost anything. And this is, has, this is dance history in its sort of like, in its, in its core. It's always been like this, but it really came into Sweden the last 10, 15 years. Shall we have some yeah, examples? Yeah, we'll look, at, we'll look at this example. This is our 10 companies. Uh, Christina Caprioli is one of the bigger choreographers, most established choreographers. Her company, CCAP, uh, works from Stockholm, but she also supports and works with lots of local artists. Uh, her most recent uh, invention is the Sunday run-ups, where she inv invites artists to present their work every Sunday in her space. Stina Nyberg, uh, a quite young choreographer. This is a piece that she created on Nikolai Tesla, where she actually built a Tesla coil, so she dances with the electricity on stage. This is also one part of Swedish choreography these days. She actually dances with it. Morten Spongberg, many of you might have known his work. He's been presented in New York quite a few times, but also very much internationally. He was also head of the School of Docs choreography section in the, in the beginning, and many artists came out inspired from him. Björn Sefstin, another Swedish artist. This is a recent work called Landscapes of Eye, and in the, the Will Rawls sitting on the floor is one, uh, one of the more, pro more prominent performers in New York who came to work with us. So there's a strong connection between the US with also performers coming to work in Sweden and Swedish performers, dancers, choreographers traveling to the US. Amanda Patria and Hala Olofsdotter, more in an old school performance style. Uh, this is a piece called Dead. They first did a piece called Beauty and the Beast, uh, based on Beauty and the Beast, where they challenged the, the, the notions of beauty in their pieces. Linda Blomqvist, another example. Uh, she was educated at Rosas, Anna Teresa de Kirschmacher's school in Belgium, and many of artists coming to Sweden have, have actually gone through that school. This is also one example of interactive work that Swedish artists do, a lot of interactive work. Ludwig Dohr, who is a good example of the international relation that Sweden has with the rest of the world and also Scandinavia. He's a Norwegian working in Sweden and in Norway. Gunilla Heilborn, her pieces are mostly based on text. Uh, very funny, very humorous. And I would say she's maybe one of the most pioneering artists really taking the sort of the Nordic feel into her works. Uh, very nostalgic, funny, humorous pieces. She was just presented in Montreal in a Scandinavian festival, for example. Claire Parsons is an example of one movement in Sweden which has to do with children's work. And the uh, children's work, of course, come from a tradition of Swedish theater working with children's work for a long time, Susan Austin and so forth. Claire has been presented in the US many times and will certainly come back. Kenneth Kvarnström, is maybe one of the more famous Swedish-Finnish choreographers in, from Sweden, whose work is really based on movement uh, and has toured in the US quite a lot. Uh, this is a piece that he created uh, a few years ago. Paul, who's in the middle of this trio, is also dancing in the piece that you're gonna see with us. And then Kulber Ballet, uh, who is now the former Kobo Ballet was with Mats Ek work. They've gone uh, through a long transition of, of directors. Deborah Hay, the, 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 the prominent US choreographer, came and made a work with them, who's been, and that work has been performed in the US quite a lot as well. And we have Well Company, which is the last example, and which is gonna bring us over into a US collaboration. Well Company is an example of, of how Swedish dance has developed in the last 10 years. Well Company is based at a small basement venue in Stockholm called Veld, from the youth word of welding and opening up. Uh, the artistic director started a dance company called Well Company, which is not really a dance company. It's sort of a play and a mock of a dance company. It only exists a few months a year. Uh, and we are very happy that this year, Yvonne Rayner will come and create the work for Well Company. 
uh, in the realm of how this is created. And I'd like to end on that point that the US and the Swedish dance context has lots and lots of interactions with each other. There are lots of US dancers working and has been working at the, at the bigger companies, both the Gothenburg Opera Dance Company, the Royal Dance Company, the Royal ba Swedish Ballet, uh, and uh, at Skånes Dance Theater, etc. And also, there's been a huge influx, of course, of, of Swedish artists going, especially to New York, which never will cease to be an inspiring place and a place where people really seek to find inspiration. And so I, the, the, the relationship between the US, the US Swedish dance scene is very strong in that sense. Maybe not, all, not only or not as much in, uh, uh, in touring, but a lot in idea exchanges in the way that we you know, sort of work in both places with performers, choreographers come and visit the US often for a long time, etc., and bring back inspiration to Sweden. That's interesting. Thank you very much for, for this introduction of, of more Swedish dance. Please, uh, Alicia, and uh, uh, come on, come on, we're going to continue a bit. So, uh, because now I'm really curious to hear, Alicia, uh, your reaction to this uh, other Swedish dance, not only uh, Arjan's uh, pieces, but, uh, and what uh, Magnus has been telling us here about the development. Is there, do you recognize this in the United States as well? Yes, I think it's really quite interesting, especially the collaborations between American choreographers and the Swedish companies. Deborah Hay was a choreographer in the 60s, 60s, 70s, part of the Judson, Judson Church scene and Judson Dance, Dance Theater. But she never had a company of her own. So many Americans have never seen her work. And that the Kohlberg Ballet is mounting this work gives Americans a chance and others a chance to see the work of Deborah Hay, who is a very acclaimed choreographer. Um, the other work that you, you mentioned as a, as a collaboration yeah. with the Yvonne Rayner. I remember Yvonne from years and years ago when I was in New York at, at um, NYU and Judson Church was sort of just, just ending. But again, Yvonne, Yvonne worked with other choreographers, with, with, with dancers that she would, she would pick up. But we don't see very much of Yvonne's work. So I think that's something else that is really great to, to, to have happen. I think I've seen some of Stina's work. I think I went to see Stina when I was in Sweden uh, the, the, the last time, um, which was not, not, so, not so long ago. And I was impressed. She's, she has done, she's a choreographer that has done her work that used the, uses a visual arts, um, um, what do you call it? almost a matrix that moves back and forth. It's, it's, um, it's got projections on it to create a, a very dynamic visual arts, art scene. And she choreographs, um, she puts dancers into that mix, but she also puts the, the audience, um, students, teachers, anybody that's in the audience to participate in this. And the dancers lead the, um, the audiences through the the maze, and then they get involved on their on their own. And I, it was really quite fascinating to watch this. And what they found, they brought in a group of kids that were autistic, and that had been very silent. But the the music started. They saw this maze of um, of, of artwork, and they became very engaged. So they began to use that as a way to. Um, um, help children with with autism, and I thought that was that was very powerful and very very meaningful. Some of the other companies I have not have not seen, but I am excited to to see them. I think I was, I was just trying to think about it. Um, there are dancers from all over the world that participate in 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 these companies, so they are not unique to to, to Sweden. I mean, it happens all over Europe now. I think that there is no, I mean, there is no such thing as a Swedish company that would have all Swedish dancers or a Netherlands uh, dance company theater that has all um, dancers from, from, from the, the Netherlands. So it's sort of an interesting thing that is happening. And I think it, is, it has to be the artistic director 
that maintains the, the vision of the company and the dancers to, to give it its patina, if you will, or to give it its um, um, s specialness. Otherwise, it, you know, all of these companies could begin to, to look alike. So I think that there is some caution that has to be exercised in companies because you do want an identity. Maybe there's a Nordic identity, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, when we did Nordic Cool in 2013, there was an Israeli choreographer that uh, did a piece on carte blanche. Now, carte blanche from Norway may have um, done the piece differently, but it, it was certainly not a Norwegian choreographer that was working with them. So anyway, I think it's, 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 it's interesting. What is interesting to me is the uniqueness of the, of, of the work. And if there is a story that is being told because of a, a body of work or how the, the choreographer works, I think Oran is cringing because talking about dance this much makes you crazy, right? <laughs> no, no, it's interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so what do you say about this? Uh, uh, because I, I do agree on this, uh, uh, Alicia, because you, you would say, uh, if you look at the Swedish companies, you know, in Sweden, we, it's a small country, so we, oh, we only got seven institutions, and one of them is Dans and Seuss. It's a venue, it's not right. a... And you know we have the 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 big the old very old it's uh, almost 300 years uh, old uh, the Royal Ballet Company and they they could dance anything from the uh, 16th century and a new creation being done here and now so it's uh, a huge uh, commitment uh, and then we have the Gothenburg Ballet that turns into a modern company uh, 20 years ago and uh, you could see it's uh, it's almost there are very very few suites in it. So it's so it's really international. Right. Uh, all these companies. Yes, and now you have Pontus Lindberg, who's yeah. become the artistic director for for the Danish, Danish dance yes, there. That's it, so that's it. I mean, the DNA is just being spread all mm. around. And, and even in the smallest, we have a very small uh, little company, uh, 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 an institution. It, there are only six or seven dancers, and they will be uh, international as well. Sorry, uh, Magnus, yeah. you wanted to. No, well, I think the the one big development that has happened in the last 10, 15 years is that. Uh, artists and also organizations have started collaborating internationally, which also brings brings the companies out to perform more in the international scene, but also makes that what happened through that process also is that we perform started to perform more at home. And I think the development of any dance dance institution or dance company or artist is to perform and meet an audience. That is the that is the, the actually the the core and also this it, it's the unifying thing for most chore choreographers in the world that they that the lack of performance opportunities so having pushed this uh, in in sweden but has also raised the quality of work and i don't mean that in any special stronger it doesn't mean matter in which stronger you you work if it's the big institutions or in your you know performing for 10 people doesn't really matter performing a lot uh, raises the quality of your work and meeting an audience. And, and through co-productions, collaborations, artists working with other artists from other parts of the world, etc., that, that creates this vortex of more performance opportunities for yeah. you. Uh, Arjan, as a choreographer, uh, what about these um, inspiration uh, fields? Have you had any inspiration from the United States, especially? Um, well, Ohad from Bacheva, he had a company in New York, I think, for 10 years. He was uh, married with Mari Kajiwa from uh, Ailey uh, early. Uh, so, I mean, he's very, uh, he has a lot from, from America. And I, I think, I mean, Yvonne Rainier and, uh, I mean, there's so many pioneers from, from America that has such a huge influence in, in Europe. So it's... Uh, I just think, particularly in Sweden, I think we had the, <laughs> we, we had this dance theater coming from um, Birgit Kohlberg, Matt's ex-mother, and that was that was more um, theater, you know. It was a, it was so. I, I had a feeling that we missed that that uh, um, uh, concept uh, conceptualist from the uh, 1970s, and but we we got it now, yeah. yeah. And actually, Ivan Reine, she, she was in uh, Stockholm f 
20 years ago. In, in 96, she was there for a whole week and the talking dancing, there was Christina Caprioli who made it. So yeah. it's, it's such an interest in, in Sweden for this uh, kind of uh, um, edge breaking or edge cutting uh, dance that used to be here and it's still on, it's still on, I would say. Uh, this, uh, what uh, Magnus was talking about, this international atmosphere, this, uh, do, do you feel practically that, or artistically that you're really working like that, uh, Ariane, that you, the world is your field? It's not Sweden, it's the world. Yes, yes, uh, for sure, it's like that, yeah. yes, definitely. Where do you, uh, do you, uh, is there any special part from the world when you find new dancers or that you feel they're working in a especially interesting way? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I couldn't, I, I, there's so many international people that I, I don't know, maybe Europe is the, but there's an American now to, uh, in this show, so no, I, I couldn't. It shows, it's an international art form, yes, isn't it? Yes. And it's also perhaps a lot of uh, thoughts you have here. I promised you to take part in this discussion, so it's really time for it now. Is there any questions? We do have some microphones here, so. Please. Do we have a microphone? No microphone. Okay, but we have. We can lend them to you. Okay, we don't. Spare one. Oh. spare one. oh yes, we can spare two. Is there any questions? Oh yes. So, what do you feel is the future of the place where text and movement meet, mm -hmm. if any future at all? and the role of voice and uh, cultures, not just, you mentioned autistic children, but cultures who are used to silence, and then when they have a chance to be in a safe space, as you imply as a choreographer, create the space, right? Um, things happen with movement. Is that from uh, that, that's from me? That yeah. <laughs> well, for, <laughs> no, for, for all the two of you, yeah. for everyone. Yes, yeah, because that was, that was a lot. It, it, yeah. it was yeah. for shall, we, shall we start? <laughs> shall we break it down into? If we start with the first question, the text. Where does where does text and what? dance meet? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to just give an example of 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 one thing of of meeting an audience that is not that doesn't have the same abilities that that we do um there are uh, there have been there's been two shows in sweden produced where uh these shows have been um uh, let me see if my english fails me but uh, interpreted sign interpreted but also visually interpreted so uh, an audience that could not hear uh, was this was interpreted f uh, that, sorry that that could not see uh, the, there was a live stream of somebody interpreting the movements through words. That was actually Stina Nyberg, one of the, the, the artists that also worked with the Tesla coil. She made a show which was very movement-based, but uh, audience that could not see it got, got it interpreted uh, live uh, in, in the space. Uh, and I, I think that and this example that, that Alicia brought up, uh, Christina Caprioli, who made a, the show that you're mentioning, is called Trees, right. yeah, uh, which where these this uh, who, who which was also a show. I sh I, it's not my show, but it was not it wasn't created in, with that purpose. But because of, of the show's uh, uh, shape and form, uh, they could bring in almost anybody into that space. It, you could come in in you know. Completely mobile, not see anything, not you know what whatever conditions you were in, old, sick, etc., and get a very interactive experience of that work. Um, and I, I think that this there is a tradition of of really working with this um, interaction of of n not just your regular audience, but an audience that 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 in has different ways of approaching movement material. And it, it, and it does come from also from uh, from this from this, the story of theatre in Sweden, where many many artists for many many years have worked with children as their primal focus, which is not very common in the world. But uh, we've had some pioneering artists in both theatre, music, and dance that has really worked with that has had children as their core audience, 
not just as a bonus audience, which is often you know the the thing. So that 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 is one reply to that. And maybe Erin, you can talk a little bit about text and yeah, text and, I and say so because you're working with text. Uh, oh, you can put your mic back. <laughs> Yes, uh, I work with text. Uh, sometimes I do r pure plays as well. Like uh, I, I did Hamlet in Gothenburg uh, last year, and um, mm, yeah. Oh, that's a big chapter to explain that. But uh, um, then the, the text becomes my music as well, and and I I I, I mix my pure actors with with dancers like I do with the musicians here in in Goldberg so I the I, I, I choreograph uh, Hamlet you might say so I put the text on top of movement and so forth and that creates new realms uh, and so forth that that's my way of um, working with text uh, but uh, this is very interesting I but I, I haven't been there yeah, to to go with new new groups like that. No. Alicia, is uh, do you recognize this? Is that the movement going on here in the United States as well? I th I think that many dancers and uh, choreographers have sort of broken away from just using the the body as the expression, but they also are talking. I remember I was we were. I was, I was at a performance with a friend of mine who's also very knowledgeable about dance, and she says, you know, I'm very surprised. Everybody's talking all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're <laughs> telling their, feeling a need, certainly, to, to tell their stories, n not just through movement, but also through text. I mean, Bill T. Jones is a, a good example of, of that. Um, Julia Rhodes' company, Art, what's, it, what's Julia Rhodes' company's name? <laughs> you can't remember. <laughs> Anyway, we're presenting Julia Rhodes' company um, next next year, and um, she also uses a lot of text to to tell to tell stories about things that uh, about issues that are current to today um, through the through the dance. I don't think it's anything anything new, but it it certainly is something that's being employed quite a bit in contemporary dance today. Yeah, if we look uh, upon history, it, it was all the same thing. Uh, the theater, it was music, it was singing, it was dancing, right. it was talking, it was also, maybe we are sort of coming back to something. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question, some more questions over here. Yeah, please. I have a little question about the trending in Swedish dance. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that Swedish dance is homegrown from theater base with Kulberg and with um, Matsiak. Uh, and it seems that American dance is a little bit more movement based and it seems that you're attracted to that too, with Deborah Hay and with Yvonne Reiner. So do you feel that there will be a merger between the theater-based dance and the movement-based dance, especially seen lately in the works of Johannes Inge and uh, Alexander Ekman and, and also Pontus Lindbergh? <laughs> it's an interesting question. Anyone who would... Uh, well, Magnus, would you like to react on that? Briefly. Oh, sorry. It's very Basically <laughs> moving from theater to movement. I think it... I think it, it uh, I would say, it, it, thank you, that's a good reflection. I think you can make that reflection on any, any choreographic context these days, that there is a section of, of, of uh, artists working with, the, what, with, with movement, but also constructing movement, you know, setting movement, while there's the tradition of also uh, working with this expanded notion of, of, of choreography. And so I wouldn't say that it, that it necessarily reflects on Sweden. It reflects on the choreographic you know, society uh, of, the, of the world. Uh, I can see now in Sweden actually that it's, it's coming, mo choreographed movement as such, it's a very, it's, you know, it's a big thing to say choreographed movement because anything can basically be that. Uh, many artists will you know, place a book on, on, the ta on, on the floor and say, this is my dance piece. You know, or stand still for, for an hour and say, this is my dance piece. But if you want to be a little bit traditional about it and saying that people setting movement on, on a dancer and, and deciding movement, there's been a tradition of that coming back in Sweden actually now for, from a younger generation. Uh, artists really setting, setting movements from, from minute one to minute 60, if you want to say that. Uh, so there is a sort of like a, a bit of a return to, to the set movement, I would say. Uh, whilst all these other trends are still going on. So body is still at the core of this. Uh, of the body, I think, still is at, at the core of all these artists' work. 
while the day and day then that expands into many different horizons sort of for uh, I think that Pontus and is a, is uh, Pontus and Alexander's style of work will always be around I think that, that that's gonna that that is a style that will always be around as well as the work of Yvonne Rayner apparently it will always but be I think around. it's also style because the people you are mentioning now Inger and Pontus and Rusmo Alexander Ekman I mean it's all the NDT people no, it's all, all, all well not Pontus maybe, but but Alexander and then Ewan Inger for sure they are very coloured by uh, Jerry Killian and, and that sort of yes. style, you know, so that you can read right away. And it's uh, I think it's um, yeah that's one genre I would say. May I ask you, uh, Ariane, where you, would you place yourself in this movement going on with this? What we in Sweden often call conceptual dance, where it, uh, with a book on the floor and this is dance and then you have the, the old uh, dance theater tradition and then these uh, different styles. Where would you place yourself, would you say? Well, it, it, just because it's conceptual, it doesn't have to be still and be a book with a hand. I mean, it can be, look at foresight. It's very conceptual, but it moves like hell, you know? So it's, that's a misconception that, if that, that just because it's conce conceptual, it doesn't, it shouldn't move. So, yeah. You can be conceptual and you move still you because you're really uh, moving. We had some more questions, yes. please. I had a question about funding for your um, companies. And related to that, I wonder if some of these, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound cynical, but I, I wonder if some choreographers have pretty much run out of um, really interesting ideas and they just are sort of spinning off Paul Taylor or Mark Morris and sort of imitating these second rate I hate to say that uh, choreographers now have to throw in the kitchen sink, throw videos, um, lyrics, poetry, just anything to attract especially younger audiences who probably wouldn't go to a modern dance performance. So two questions, the funding and how your artistic ideas are affected by filling the seats. This is a, this is an interesting question. I don't know which, we, who would like to start. Uh, well, I think it's Magnus. You more close to the money. So <laughs> very, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, as as we mentioned, we're not a company as such. Uh, we are a project-based company, and we have some. We Sweden has still. We're fortunate that we have state funding, and we have also municipality funding, and we we've been able to 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 acquire some part of that. Running running a dance company in major size is is very expensive. Uh, it is as working with with people always is and should be, and there is always, of course, not enough en enough funding for it. Uh, I would say we're in the middle of being, you know, very fortunate to get that funding regularly. But making running an operation like this with lots of people on stage also requires a lot of other different thinking of, you know, financially, economically. Uh, the other question. I would say is, uh, you know, to repeat myself, is that, that I think that, that, that that's a thing that's been going on in choreography. You know, you can have that criticism of it or that flavor of it. You know, you can both, that there's both a criticism and a, you know, and a, and a praise in, in what you're saying, I feel. Uh, that's been going on for me, you know, if you read dance history forever, even since the Baroque dance, they were, they were throwing in stuff to really, you know, uh, you know in, the, in the courts to really, you know, to, entertain people. So I, I think that there's a valid point to this. Uh, you know, when do you run out of ideas? But um, when, or when are ideas fresh and so forth? Uh, in especially in contemporary dance, I would say that since so many people get to see so little of contemporary dance, even those works that were created a long time ago have not been seen enough. So those ideas, for me, they haven't been exposed enough anyway. <laughs> so I'm, gl I'm glad to, I, I could gladly see them again and again, also because so few people actually get to see contemporary dance. And I'm happy to be in a country where we were actually bringing contemporary dance outside of the bigger cities. Because in a bigger city, maybe those ideas get repeated. But in the smaller cities or outside, people don't get to see that as they don't get to see experimental cinema or experimental art or whatever. Marcus, so, yeah. Would like to add yeah. No, I was just thinking that if you said filling seats. I mean, if you do Hamlet, you, you fill more seats. If you do Goldberg oration, you fill more seats, you know? So, uh, I mean, this, uh, uh, 
that happened for me. I mean, I, I worked for many, many years with very uh, uh, electronic and, and uh, complicated music and stuff. Uh, but I, I can, I, I like all different kind of music. When I, when I go into Bach and Beethoven and those guys or Hamlet, and it's uh, it, it fills up in a different way. It, it's it's interesting because I I didn't think about it that way. I w I'm just doing my I still do my thing, you know, whether I do Bach or B.J. Nielsen or. But yeah. Alicia, from your perspective, what does this mean to, to fill the seats and to sort of present new ideas and new choreographical stuff? How does it feel for you? Well, of course, we want people to come to the theater and to, to see new work. And I think it's very important to present new work. I think that um, the arts, I think dance, theater, music, everything evolves over, over a period of, of, of time, over decades and you want to see what's current. Otherwise, things will, will become static. In a place like the Kennedy Center, and when we are programming, we certainly look to, to have a, a balance so that we will not go uh, broke, you know, presenting, presenting artists, but we have a balance in terms of those companies that we know will fill the seats with those companies that are doing more innovative, more creative, more um, groundbreaking work because it's it's important to to have have both and I don't think that work that is popular is necessarily is, is necessarily bad I mean I think it's 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 quite good but we have to have it but there is a continuum of how the how the work um, is is perceived by the by the, by the public and you'd ask the question about funding for 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 dance companies I think all of the um, dance companies struggle to raise money to be able to do the to, to do the work they want to do. I think that you do see many more collaborations happening because that is a way to leverage money and to be able to be creative and um, and and get the work get the work done. So it's it, but it is it is it is a struggle. It's a struggle in this country and a struggle in around the world as I have seen it. My friends, time is passing so quickly when we have interesting things to listen to and uh, it's time to close this conversation for today. Uh, but we will dance on and anyone who's now, or everyone who's now very curious about what it looks like when it moves, because we only had still pictures here, you have to go to the Kennedy Center and see the Goldberg variations created by uh, Urian here uh, and you have is it four, four performances? Four, it's, it's four different performances coming on this week, so take the chance. And I would like to say thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia, for bringing this performance here and uh, <laughs> showing it for the American people. Thank you, Arian, for coming here, and thank you, Magnus, for coming here and sharing, us, uh, with sharing your thoughts with us. And thank you, Linda and the Embassy, for bringing us here. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>